Patriarchs Dower Peters and Zinkov of Jewish Studies and History, and Rebecca Seitz of the Music Department for organizing this event and for gathering both scholars and sponsors to make it happen. And I would like to greet our distinguished guests from the United States of Israel who are traveling to New Brunswick to share their work with us today. College. One was vaguely aware that she and her sister, Fanny Nixon Einstein, were owners of Bach manuscripts, and that another sister, Bella Nixon Einstein, were owners of, excuse me, that Bella Nixon Solomon had presented her 14 year old grandson, Felix Mendelssohn, with a copy of the St. Matthew Passion on Christmas Day, 1823. But of Sarah's broader contributions to music and cultural life, and the wider world of the Itzik family, little was noted. In retrospect, one suspects this was due in part to the residue of anti-Semitism from the Nazi era in Germany, but to the general reluctance of modern scholarship to accord women a significant place in musical and cultural history, and most importantly, to the absence of the manuscript collection of the Berlin Zing Academy, uh, which had disappeared during World War II. Uh, the recovery of this collection with its extensive Sarah Lee holdings due to the brilliant political negotiations of Christoph Wolf in 1999 and its return to the Berlin Staatsbibliothek in December 2001, uh, just in time for Christmas or Hanukkah, depending how you want to view it, uh, made possible for the first time uh, our ability to recognize the significant role of Sarah Lee in Berlin musical life. Uh, subsequent studies of Christoph Wolf and Peter Volney, in particular, have opened the realm of Levy and the remarkable Itzig family to our eyes. In the past decade, in fact, matters have so progressed that Sarah Levy's salon activities and championing the music of the Bach family have been compared with those in Vienna of Baron von Sweden, who famously introduced Mozart and Beethoven to the works of J.S. Bach. Indeed, Sarah Levy is now occasionally mentioned as the Baron von Sweden of Berlin. Uh, it's my hope that with continued work of symposia such as this, such as ours today, we may reach the point when Baron von Sweden is referred to as the Sarah Levy of Vienna. <laughs> it gives me great pleasure to introduce my good faculty colleague from the School of Arts and Science, Nancy Sinkoff. Uh, Dr. Zinkoff is Associate Professor of Jewish Studies and History and Chair of the Jewish Studies Program here at Rutgers. Uh, she is the author of books and essays focusing especially on Judaism in Eastern Europe, Poland in particular, and the political, economic, social, and geographic issues that influence religious life in the modern world. She's held Fulbright, ACLS, Mellon, and other major scholarship uh, fellowships. And most significantly, she was recently elected to the board of directors of the National Association for Jewish Studies. This morning, she will open our symposium by introducing us to Sarah Levy's world. Professor Sinkoff. Um, I want to thank uh, Dean Safra for his um, introduction, but before I make my remarks, I have to introduce a very important guest, which is the representative from the New Jersey Council for the Communities. So I really um, invite you to say a few words. Without the support of the New Jersey Council of the Humanities, uh, the symposium would have been far less um, uh, robust and vital, so we're so grateful for their support. My name is Brian Greenfield. I'm the Executive Director of the New Jersey Council for the Humanities, and I want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to uh, be a sponsor of this terrific program. One of the great things that we love to do at the Council is to really build the bridges between the universities and our communities and to be able to make available some of the wonderful scholarship and thought that happens here on campuses like this to our larger public. And so we're very grateful for this opportunity to be a sponsor of this program. Um, the humanities are the ways in which we explore our culture. Good morning. My name is Shmuel Feiner. I'm from Bar Yan University. 
and I was asked to be the moderator of this session. I'm very happy to be here today. Um, people uh, are asking me, um, did I come especially from Israel for this symposium? Well, my answer is yes, and I find it really uh, interesting and important. Um, you know that uh, we are in a very special week according to the Jewish calendar between two important Jewish holidays, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and this is a time of considering, and I think that this symposium can give us an opportunity to reconsider uh, issues of Jewish identity, and some of them are very relevant to Jewish life today, so I'm really glad to be in this special uh, conference here is in Rutgers. I would like to thank the organizers, and especially, of course, Rebecca and, and Nancy, and, uh, and all of us who attended the concert last night, we are still under a big impression of this imp uh, in, in impressive uh, concert where we could really present in a certain way in Sour Lady Salon. And now, in the first session today, we are going to learn and to discuss Judaism and gender in Enlightenment Berlin. Uh, Professor Sinkov already given us a very nice introduction to the entire uh, um, topics that we are going to discuss, and now we are going to start this session. We have two speakers in this session. Each of, uh, of them is going to speak for 25 minutes, and then I'm going to give a, a general comment and say something about the first paper. The, the other one, we didn't have a chance to read fully yet. Uh, and then we are going to uh, open the floor for uh, a general discussion. And let me first introduce uh, the two speakers. The first speaker will be Dr. Natalie Neimar Goldberg. She's a historian of German uh, Jewry in the modern times, uh, also from my university, from Barian University. Um, she is a, a researcher at the Leopold Institute uh, in Jerusalem. And uh, I'm sure for those who are deep in our subject, they all know that she is the author of the news book on the topic um, Jewish Women in Enlightenment Berlin. And the other speaker is Professor Eliane Reisberg from the University of Pennsylvania. And she authored and edited many publications in the field of German Jewish studies. She also curated a few interesting and important exhibitions. And from my perspective, I find fascinating and, and, and impressive um, the way that she uh, combined uh, history and literature and philosophy and, and in her uh, research is always very <coughs> sensitive, very colorful, and uh, there's a lot to learn from her. So uh, I would like uh, to call uh, Natalie Goldberg and the topic of her. A paper is remaining within the full the cultural and social world of Star Eleven. We have gathered here to learn about the life and the world of Sarah Levy, a rather unknown figure in modern Jewish history and in the history of music. I'd like to congratulate Nancy and Rebecca. I was so excited when I heard about this uh, symposium because I, I couldn't believe this was happening. And uh, that you dedicated this symposium to this fascinating woman, giving her the attention she deserves, and grateful for the invitation uh, to participate in this exciting event. <coughs> Personally, Sarah Levy had intrigued me when I studied the life of Jewish women in the life of Berlin, although she's a rather minor figure in the book I wrote on the topic. In my study, Levy is presented as part of a remarkable group of educated Jewish women who were influenced by secularizing trends and led an acculturated lifestyle, deeply involved in the intellectual, cultural, and social scene of their time. Thanks to this invitation, I delved more deeply into her case and examined further, further sources, reassessing her affiliation to this group of women. Towards this lecture, I inquire again, to what extent was Sarah Levy an intrinsic part of this circle, 
How similar was her social and cultural world, her lifestyle, and her way of thinking and acting to that of other women in this group? Examining the distinctive features of her particular case in comparison with the whole group yields, I believe, interesting results. Sarah Levy, born in Berlin in 1761 to the wealthy Itzik family, was exceptional already at first sight, compared to many of her peers, being one of the few who remained Jewish. Whereas the better known women from her milieu, notably uh, Rachel Levine, Farm Hagen, Dorothea Mendelssohn, Henrietta Gertz, and many others, embraced Christianity at a certain point, Sarah Levy never left the world. When she died in old age, she was laid to rest at the Schönhauser Island Cemetery that served the Berlin Jewish community at the time. Of course, Sarah Levy was not alone in her lifelong allegiance to Judaism. Her more famous sister, Fanny Arnstein, who lived in Vienna after her marriage, also died as a Jew, as did all of their numerous siblings. Also steadfast in their Judaism were Amalie Bell, another wealthy and acculturated Jewish woman in Berlin, who hosted, along with her husband, early reform services in her home, and Recha Mendelssohn, a daughter of Moses Mendelssohn, who condemned her sister's conversion to Catholicism and never considered baptism. But many other women did convert, and those who didn't may be, in a way, seen as the exception. Yet besides this basic difference, Sarah Levy's social and cultural world seemed similar to that of other women who eventually took the step of baptism. And this is what allowed me and other scholars to include her without any hesitation in the group of Salonier, or as a golden and lively Jewish woman. To begin with, Sarah Levy's social life didn't differ from that of those women. It is a well-known fact that she had close relations with gentle friends, many of whom frequented her home. The long list includes notable intellectuals, young students, learned women, and of course, musicians. Moreover, like them, Sarah Levy participated in enlightenment societies, which allowed Jews and non-Jews to socialize and discuss cultural matters. One of the associations she joined, the New Wednesday Society, founded in 1795 in Berlin, was among the few that accepted Jews and women as regular members. Other correligionists in this framework were, for instance, Isaac Oitler and Henrietta Hertz. A second feature that Sarah Levy shared with this group of Jewish female friends was her intense participation in the German and European cultural world. Many of her friends were active in the literary field. Some even accomplished authors, and notably uh, Dorothea Mendelssohn and Esther Dahl. In the case of Sarah Levy, the main field of activity was music. We all know that she was a skilled harpsichordist, that she revealed an extraordinary proficiency in music, that she was a Bach enthusiast and a patron and close friend of the Bach family, commissioning pieces of music from this family of composers to be later performed in various circles. And we know that she also collected the works. A peculiar Bach piece in her possession was a cantata by William A. Friedemann Bach that she apparently commissioned for her own wedding, as we heard yesterday, we was not like to uh, see its performance yesterday. To this list of uh, music-related attributes, we could also add the fact that Levy subscribed to numerous uh, German publications in the field, and also her affiliation to the Zing Academy, which is particularly interesting. Levy, as other fellow Jews, became a member of this academy, which was a Berlin Choral Society, established in 1791. This society offered a public framework for Levy's musical activities, and she took part in its concerts, which she performed as a soloist for the German audience. As we heard just that yesterday, she would donate part of her impressive music collection to its library. This participation in the Sing Academy had significance for her as a Jew, because it allowed her to perform as part of a Christian choir, but was especially meaningful for her as a woman, as it offered the possibility to fulfill a public role which was then elusive for members of her sex. Again, in her affiliation to the academy, she was no different from Jews who exhibited a weaker connection to Judaism. Members of the academy, since its early years of existence, included future converts, as Fatshim Lindman, a close friend of Rachel Levine, 
Lea Solomon, who was Sarah's niece, and her future husband, Adam Mendelssohn. Even though the Academy was a Christian society, Sarah Levy wasn't deterred from participating in it more than, any, uh, more than other Jews with weaker bonds to their religion. And indeed, a third aspect that Sarah Levy shared with less committed Jews is the fact that she also embraced the Christian elements from German and European culture. Practices and cultural forms that were associated with Christianity but had lost to some extent the religious significance propagated among Jews of this generation. What is significant is that this was happening before they converted, and also in the case of Jews who never left the Jewish faith. One prominent example is the taste that modernizing Jews acquired for church music. The pleasure Jews derived from this cultural form, which was very popular at the time and engaged the most notorious composers, often led them within the church walls, not in order to participate in Christian worship, but as spectators attracted to an edifying performance. The letters of uh, the young uh, Ludwig Berman reveal that in 1803, while living in Berlin as a student and having just left the Frankfurt Ghetto, he attended the execution of the famous and at the time extremely popular oratorio, the Tod Jesu, the Death of Jesus, composed by Brown in 1755. When he arrived at the Nicholas Church, Berman met none other than Henrietta Hertz, his landlady and tutor's wife. Hertz apparently attended every year the performance of his devotional work, as did other Jews, perhaps also Sarah Levy. What is certain is that Levy was fond of this type of music, and it didn't bother her that the compositions she admired most had the Christian roots. The inclination of acculturated Jews for church music could encompass more than mere aesthetic appreciation as part of the audience. It could involve actual participation in its performance, a remarkable point given the strong Christian links of this activity. The participation of Jews in the Zing Academy is a significant example. Jewish members of this society, including Sarah Levy, felt free to perform Christian music and their Jewishness never prevented them from participating in public concerts at unmistakably Christian places as cathedrals and churches. The irony of this involvement did not pass unnoticed, and one contemporary observer claimed that Jewish singers taking part in Graham's oratorio on the death of Jesus were in fact singing against themselves. Christian elements penetrated the confines of family life as well. Already members of the previous generation let typical Christian motifs enter their homes. The art collection decorating the house of Sarah Levy's parents included at least two items for Christian themes, pictures of Saint Jerome and in the desert and of Mary Magdalene. The Ephraim and Fleece mansions displayed similar Christian objects. Much more consequential was the incursion of Christmas into Jewish households especially since the 18, uh, 1800s. The celebration of this holiday as a private event in the family bosom with a brightly adorned tree at its center was a new custom spreading then in non-Jewish society, not by chance parallel to the rise of the bourgeoisie and the expansion of secularization. Christmas in its modern garb was perceived as a secular, private facility the celebration of the bourgeois family par excellence, more than as a Christian religious holiday. As such, Jewish men and women seeking integration into the German middle class could adopt it without serious drawbacks. The house of Fanny and Nathan Arnstein, for instance, was apparently the first to post a Christmas tree in the Habsburg capital. During the Vienna Congress, the sister of Sarah is said to have brought from Berlin the new custom of celebrating Christmas Eve with a decorated tree on the presents. The Arnstein couple was never baptized. Moreover, at the time they celebrated Christmas, Fanny was using her contacts to promote Jewish causes. The Christian celebration and the sense of Jewish commitment obviously did not exclude each other. The Arnstein case was by no means exceptional. Christmas was celebrated by other lifelong Jews as Henrietta Mendelssohn and her husband Joseph. Moses Mendelssohn's only son to remain Jewish, or by Heide Levine, Rachel Levine, Farnhagen's mother, 
remain attached to Jewish tradition and care to celebrate Jewish holidays in the family circle until her death. Sarah Levy may also have been part of the, of the secularized Christmas festivities, though I haven't found direct evidence for that. I have only come across the assumption mentioned uh, earlier that either she or her sister, Bella Solomon, also a lifelong Jew, may have given a copy of Bach's masterpiece, San Mati Passion, to Felix Mendelssohn, who was Bella's grandchild and Sarah's grandnephew, and perhaps also to his sister Fanny as a Christmas present around 1825. It is interesting to know that a leading scholar, Larry Todd, presents the testimony of Edward de Vuillant, a friend and collaborator of Felix Mendelssohn, as the source for this claim, but he dismisses it as impossible. Todd writes, how are we to understand Bella, an Orthodox Jew who had cursed the Protestant Jacob a Bartoli, a converted son, in 1805, and was unaware in 1823 that her children and grandchildren had converted, presenting Bach's passion as a Christmas present. Todd favors the claim that it was probably a birthday gift. It's hard to conclude if it was indeed a Christmas present or not. What is certain is that the fact that both Bella and Sarah were loyal Jews does not exclude this possibility. That is, not only converted Jews were celebrating Christmas, even if both sisters remain attached to Judaism, they may still have commemorated the holiday in its modern style. In light of this evidence, it is legit legitimate to ask whether Sarah Levy's lifelong affiliation to Judaism had concrete implications at all. We know that certain women converted to Christianity for pragmatic reasons, to marry a non-Jew, to give their own children better opportunities for a promising future, for economic reasons, and maybe Sarah Levy lacked any of these motivations, and therefore never baptized, remaining, however, indifferent to her own religion. We could at this point sum up and say that modernizing Jewish women all went through a process of radical acculturation, only that, that some, unlike Sarah Levy, took a further step of conversion. However, my contention is that it is wrong to downplay Sarah Levy's Jewishness. Unlike most uh, Jewish salami, Levy, parallel to her intense participation in German culture and music, was strongly involved in Jewish causes and institutions throughout her life, and took a deep interest, particularly in Jewish education. This was, in fact, an important dimension of her life, even though it has received little emphasis in research, with attention usually focused on processes of acculturation and assimilation. Of special interest is her connection with the Haskalah, the Jewish Enlightenment. It is a peculiar thing to say about a woman that she was associated with this movement. First of all, the Haskalah, especially at that time, is known to have excluded women from its ranks. Moreover, Jewish women of her generation, despite their involvement in Enlightenment culture, expressed no interest whatsoever in bringing their knowledge and their critical attitude to be upon Jewish society. Yet Sarah Levy clearly did, promoting masculine projects and goals throughout her life. And we know uh, very well about male members of the Itzik family supporting the Ascala, but hardly anything about female invo involvement, either Sarah's or her sisters. Admittedly, Sarah's connection to the Ascala was not as strong as that of male members of her family, notably her father Daniel Itzik, her brother Isaac, and her own husband, Salomon Levy. Not every couple that married had the honor of having a special legal point written for the occasion, but Sarah Itzik and Salomon Levy did. And this was certainly due to her father's, or maybe her husband's, solid links with the masculine, who wrote Epithalamia for friends and colleagues, or for wealthy patrons. The author, Joseph B., was obviously close enough to Sarah's father or bridegroom to see and write a poem for the newlyweds. And I mentioned about the German cantata, also a comp a composed for this occasion. So in fact, the couple had two different types of artistic uh, creations celebrating their wedding. One from the Jewish and one from the German beyond. And this is, uh, I think, an early sign of the parallel dimensions that they would coexist throughout the Israeli's life. However, beyond this connection of male relatives with the Haskalah, Sarah was also personally involved. One proof of this is her support of masculine literature, 
which is evident from the fact that her name figures among the subscribers of several Hebrew books. This may seem as a small detail, but is in fact very telling. Although subscribing to a modern Hebrew book did not necessarily mean one would read it, it did mean an interest in Ascalon literature or at least ideological support of this movement. One book she subscribed to was a very interesting publication called Smirot Israel, perhaps the Ascalon's bestseller. This was an Ascalic edition of the Book of Psalms, published between 1785 and 1791 in five volumes, featuring Moses Mendelssohn's German translation of the text in Hebrew characters. This edition was unique in that the first volume consisted of several long introductions with sections dedicated to the history of music and a discussion of musical instruments in biblical times, including even illustrations, an unusual sight in contemporary Hebrew books. Since this symposium is focused on Jewish and music at the beginning of modernity, let me add two remarks about the significance of this project that we also help elucidate Levi's interest precisely in it. Smirot Israel is a relatively early engagement with music, at least on a theoretical level, on the part of leading Maskelin. The German scholar did not engage much in music, and Smirot Israel is clearly an important exception. Second, this publication prompts us to re-examine the assumption concerning the almost total disinterest of Maskelin for music. This project, as said a bestseller of the Haskalah, printed at the only Oil Kalisha book of Gerai, the Maskelike Printing House in Berlin, devotes considerable attention to music. And one of its explicit goals was to raise the interest of young Jews in this cultural field. And this may have certainly a, attracted the interest of Saudi. As said, the long list of subscribers includes the name of Marat Severi Levi, our protagonist. It was not typical of women to subscribe to masculine books. Female names rarely appear in these lists, and when they, when they took, it's usually widows. In fact, it is often the name of Sarah's husband that is mentioned in many books, not hers. But we see that, though unusual, this kind of female participation and support was possible. And if it was important for a woman and she had the means, she could leave testimony of her allegiance and have her own name written. Another curious name in the list, or in, those in, in, from the world of music, is say Carl Bernhard Wesley, the composer and director of the Berlin National Theatre. Some two decades later, already as a widow, when many of her friends and close relatives had left or were, were about to leave Judaism, Levy still supported the goals of Jewish and even Hebrew education, as we learn from her subscription to another book called Mudari Yaldeit in Israel, and in German, Israelitische Kinderfreund. In this textbook from 1812, printed simultaneously in three languages, German, Hebrew, and French, her name figures as a plain monarchy for the Hebrew edition, one of only three female subscribers. We may assume she didn't purchase this textbook for her personal use, and also she didn't have children of her own, so it was obviously not for her own family, but uh, she may have done it uh, as a way to support this enterprise, either to assist the author who headed a private modern school in Berlin, or to advance masculine goals, mainly Hebrew and modern education among uh, Jewish children. That she considered the promotion of Jewish modern education a central goal is apparent from her strong involvement with the Freischule, the school established by family members in Berlin in 1778. At least since the death of her husband in 1806, Levy took an interest in its curriculum and contributed funds to the school. Its director, Lazarus Ben David, mentioned Sarah's name year after year in his school reports as one of the main benefactors. It was to a large extent, thanks to her constant funding, that the Jewish school subsisted until 1825. One could assume that her long-standing dedication to this institution was due to the fact that this was a family enterprise, which is strove to keep alive. But that doesn't seem to be the only reason. When the Freischule eventually closed, she continued supporting other projects aimed at fostering Jewish education. For instance, the Jewish Community School Talmud Torah in Berlin, established in 1826. 
This school, headed first by Leopold Sunz and then by, by Baruch Auerbach, put greater emphasis than the Freischule on Jewish education, and Sarah Levy was one of its patrons. In addition to a sum of money, a paroche, and educational instruments, Levy donated no less than 141 volumes of valuable works to its library, as per one of its reports, perhaps the largest donation of books to this new institution. And we know more about her contribution of books and manuscripts to the Sing Academy, and we don't know so much about this uh, aspect of her uh, life. Still deeper was her involvement in the Jewish orphanage annexed to the school some years later, where she fulfilled important function, functions as mother of honor at a quite advanced age. In addition to administrative responsibilities, she undertook practical roles that put her in direct contact with the pupils. It is important to stress again that this was not a Jewish institution just by name. Its goal was to inculcate in these children knowledge and love for the Jewish religion. It followed Jewish law, strictly keeping the Sabbath and the Jewish holidays, as well as rules of Kashrut. Parallel to these educational activities, Levy also remained affiliated to Jewish Association of Life, joining, for instance, the Bude Verein, a society of mutual help established in 1815 by Jewish merchants. Unlike the more famous Society of Friends, this association did accept married men and widows. To the list of Jewish affiliations, we could add Levy's support of Jewish intellectuals, which is parallel to her support of German musicians that we often hear of. The, more, the most famous Jew she assisted was Salomon Mayer. While living in Berlin, this philosopher was a welcome guest at the Levis and had special links with the housewife, for whom he felt deep appreciation. Sarah also personally intervened in favor of Moses Besley, a merchant and writer who lived in Hamburg but belonged to her social network, and she tried to ameliorate, ameliorate her, his poor financial condition. When Vesely died, leaving his family unprovided, she used her influence to have a posthumous volume of his writings printed for their economic benefit. Thus, although some of her contacts with Jewish intellectuals were initiated by her husband, who turned their home into a meeting point for the masculine, one can hardly imagine Sarah Levy in the image of Frommet Mendelssohn as portrayed in the famous painting by Moritz Daniel Oppenheim holding a tray and standing behind her husband and his intellectual partners. Her place was definitely downstage, as a main actor in the world of German and Jewish life. Levy's case challenges the assumption of dichotomous fields of action for men and women, as if a gender moved exclusively in different orbits, as if women had everything to do with assimilation and nothing to do with Jewish concerns. The point I've been trying to make is that Sarah Levy was not Jewish just because she was born so and never found a reason to convert, but was rather a committed Jew. She was able to combine her activity in the non-Jewish world with her uninterrupted commitment to Jewish causes in a way that other women, including some of her relatives and most of her friends, weren't able to achieve. Like many contemporary Jewish women, she was deeply immersed in German and European culture and society. But unlike them, she led for almost 23 years a modern Jewish life and died as a Jew. Sarah believed in Jewish continuity and decried her many relatives who opted out of Judaism. Left behind by all those who converted, she felt like a leafless tree in the autumn of her life. 